Why was Wellington's move last week, Jim, of such significance? David, you and I have been doing this. We've had this conversation for a long time. When you started reporting, it took you 40 holders to get to 40% of the stock of a public company. Today, it takes you eight. Eight. Think about that. Eight holders. Three of those are passive indexed funds that hold over 20% of the stock of every U.S. company. Vanguard and BlackRock, of course. Right. And then another five in actives. Um, and so those eight holders will dictate the outcome of pretty much any vote in the United States. And that's a new phenomenon. We haven't been in that situation before. And you also have this battle between the actives and the passive. So if you look, follow the money. If you look since 2006, the active, uh, the passive ETFs have dominated on revenue generation versus the actives. So the actives are now saying, look, we need to demonstrate our influence. We charge more than an ETF. We have a human being who picks stocks, who does research, and we want to have that influence. Here in the Bristol deal, which they're entitled to vote how they want, but they didn't just vote. They jumped ahead to the beginning of the process. They tried to be New Hampshire and dictate the outcome of what was going to happen. And it's unfortunate that when they do that, it's a two-paragraph statement. They don't take phone calls. There's no due process. And frankly, that's, that's really not fair to the other holders or to Bristol or Selgin. In terms of entering into the debate, if you will, because uh, to your point, I tried to follow up with Wellington, got nothing. Even submitted questions via email and got nothing. But why is it so significant? I mean, people may not know Wellington well. It's a very large firm, of course. But typically, these kinds of shareholders don't say anything, right? Right. They never do. But we've been building towards this for five years. So in order for Wellington to do what they did, the compliance and legal review that they had to put in place, the infrastructure and the people they've added, they're going to do this again, David. And the active uh, managers have got to, in their view, fight back. In fact, you see a quote from Newberger. Who, who made a, a settlement on the Ashland situation where they said, look, we do the research, we do the work, we don't want to give the vote just to these three index funds, and so we're going to jump out and we're going to be very, very vocal, and that dynamic has big implications for every company who's going to do a deal or is going to make a major decision. You're going to have to engage with these holders in a much different way. You're going to have to understand the politics between them. So it used to be a one-way conversation. Why is this deal good for Bristol shareholders and Celgene holders? Today, it's a, a question of why is it good for those folks and why is it good for Wellington's holders? Mm -hmm. Okay, and the Wellington holders or the ETF holders, they don't have a lot of influence on how Wellington votes. So we've got a dynamic here where the SEC is looking at this. We know they're looking at it. And Jay Clayton's a great head looking, of the SEC. Looking at what? They're looking at the concentration of vote. Five. Asset management dramatically favors scale. Next year, there are going to be five or six holders going to control everything. I mean, is BlackRock, they're going to have 20, they have six trillion today. They're going to basically be the They're going to own 20% of every company in the United States. What does that mean? Right. Are we ready for that? And, and I don't think the SEC is ready for that. They're studying it. But this needs to move up their agenda. The 13D rules were designed for Bruce Wasserstein and T. Boone Pickens. We're in a different world. But, you know, we've also been in a world where activist investors, names that we know, whether yes. it be Starboard in this case, but, uh, or Elliot, or Third Point, or Carl Icahn, uh, have typically given voice through their actions to some of these shareholders who remain quiet. That's no longer going to be the case either? I don't think so. I think you're going to see, but I think you will see actives partner. They're going to be a swing vote. They'll partner with the activists when they think that makes sense. They'll partner with the company when that makes sense. But they're going to take some flows from activism. They're going to take some prominence from activism, and they're going to take some from the ETFs. They don't like the world where on one hand you have Jeff Smith, and the other hand you have BlackRock, and nothing in between. All right, so um, bottom line it for me on how you're going to change your conversations with a CEO who's considering doing a deal that really hasn't been socialized at all in the marketplace or is kind of going to come out of left field the way BMY's deal with Celgene did. How does that conversation differ now than it did maybe a few Tradi years ago? Traditional investor relations was not a strategic position. Now it is. Uh, CEOs have to have a deep relationship with their top holders. There are eight or nine people, in effect, that will control the destiny of, of a company. That CEO has to know those folks like he or she knows their top eight customers. And does it make less likely they would do the big deal? It makes it less likely they're going to do anything that's a surprise. 
anything that's big and surprising, it was always hard, as you know. It just got a lot harder. Uh, and I think without the proper signaling or, or some type of directionality being given to the shareholder base, if you catch your shareholder base by surprise, this is the kind of thing that can happen. Jim, we're going to stay on it. And I think particular issue as well is that other one you raised about BlackRock having so much power. Conversation for another day, but a very important one. Well, but this is not about so much just this deal. This is about the next 100 deals. And we're going to be in this state for the next 10 years. And so w the reality is we're going to start talking about a different conversation. These shareholders are going to be at the table, and we're going to have to deal with them. Jim, Thanks, thank David. you. Sure thing. Okay. Jim Woolery.